Welcome back, folks. And I must say I'm very impressed by your keeping the time so good here. We appreciate that a lot. Our next lecture is um, coming from our neighboring country, Denmark. And um, what are you doing here, Kalle? Not <laughs> You're not I supposed to be here yet. No, <laughs> well, the thing is that uh, Per Christian Matson uh, got the flu and he's still not well enough to travel. So he said, I don't want to risk anything. I don't want to spread the flu here. So unfortunately, he couldn't come today. But happily, we have a solution here by Kalle Melin. He is going to uh, present the PowerPoint of Per Christian Matson. And we are very grateful for that. Per Christian Matson, if you have worked with uh, material pottery or churches from uh, Ribe, Denmark, you probably heard the name Per Christian Matson because he is an icon working with this kind of material uh, there. I remember also uh, books, literature from, from him. He also been working as uh, head of the uh, National Museum in, in uh, Copenhagen and especially the Department of uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance. And I think he's a pensionist now, but he's still going strong. So we are, unluckily, uh, it couldn't work this time, but he had prepared a speech, a talk, research on Danish medieval church roofs, types, roofings, and datings. And well, Per Christian Matsion, alias, or vice versa, Kalle <laughs> Melin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will, I will yeah. just uh, present the real, uh, the real <laughs> person <laughs> behind the alias here uh, also. Uh, was thinking how to present you and uh, <laughs> I will tell about uh, this, this summer I did repair and construction work with my son on my house. And at one stage he, my son asked me, Dad, do you know this or have you only read it in a book? <laughs> uh, and Kalle here, he is a person who has knowledge in church building in theory and practice. Uh, he's a restorer, archaeologist uh, and a master carpenter. And since 2018 also a PhD student at the University of Gothenburg. And you have worked uh, in several research-led restoration and reconstruction projects, such as Söderåda, the reconstruction of the medieval wooden church, and also the restoration of uh, Inga Torp Tithbarn. But now you will present, no, not now, <laughs> after Per Christian, you will present the results from the project Historic Carpentry Art in the Diocese of Lund. And you will have this marathon talk, uh, the one after another. So mm. the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to read, uh, uh, I haven't learned Pa Christians uh, by heart, sorry. And uh, Pa Christians uh, says hello to everybody and he's really sorry he couldn't be here and um, he's a great researcher as they told you and um, he's one of my mentors in research. So this, I hope this will go good. Uh, medieval Denmark included the landscapes of Scania, Halland and Blekinge which have been parts of Sweden since 1658. Robin and Kalle and many others take good care of these parts of the world and they will tell us about their spectacular roofs. Looking to the south, present day Denmark has since 1920 included the northern part of the Duchy of Schleswig. So when I refer in the following to southern Jutland, this means northern Schleswig in present day Danish Sønderjylland. Research on medieval church building began in Denmark in the 1830s. However, roofs did not become a real part of this until 1887. Then one of the directors of the National Museum, by the name of Sophus Milo, published a study of a certain small group of roofs in churches in western Jutland. These he dated to the Romanesque period 
by their distinctive shape, showing an almost perfect rounded arch toward the church interior. By doing so, he claimed that they were from the time of the erection of these churches and that the churches had had an open roof. Uh, and here's one of those uh, on this picture. The leading, leading figures in church research and arch architectural history of those days, who were mainly architects, came forward with much criticism against this first attempt. As we shall learn later in this lecture, Miller was absolutely right by assuming that the roofs were medieval, although not as old as he suggested. The churches simply had got new roofs of this special type. Miller also pointed out to the important information which was given by the tool marks and the timber numbers on the roof trusses which he clearly identified. After this initial phase, only some few new contributions were published in more than a half a century. But the archives on the National Museum hold quite some descriptions of church roofs and timber numbering, which show that the museum staff recognized the existence of roofs as interesting parts of the buildings, but were mostly unaware of their proper dating. The general idea at the Natural, Natural Museum until around 1950 was that most church roofs in all parts of the country had been more or less totally renewed due to total repairs. Scattered and rather few finds of reused timber <coughs> from wooden church constructions in the stone churches only seem to confirm this way. You. A famous uh, example was the so-called Herning plank, which was found inside the stone wall of the church in eastern Jutland in the 1880s. It was correctly identified as a hammer beam fragment, and much later it was dated by Denver chronology to 1070s. An excavation beneath the church revealed the post holes from a small wooden church showing a ground plan similar to those of several wooden churches in North Germany, as it has been demonstrated by Klaus Ahrens. Some of them in fact only present a rectangular plan without neither chancel nor an apse. Christianity was officially adopted by the Danish king in 1963. And, um, the question is where people actually went to church, but this will not be the theme here. Concerning church roofs, a change in research became manifest with the work published by the architect and editor of the Danish inventory series of all Danish churches, Elna Möller, in 1953. As part of her work for the inventory of the churches in southern Denmark, she had realized that medieval timber roofs were in fact rather common throughout this landscape and in, in, in southwestern Jutland. Her publications from 1953 presented her initial results in the form of a typology on the basis of the construction of the roof trusses. She named the two types, which seemed the oldest ones by the name of the churches, with the most well-preserved examples. So until this day we know the names, the Aral type and the Ruago type, as well as the technical term, the cross beams type and the color beam type. I shall come back to them. Mello simply wanted to visit all Danish medieval churches in order to register and describe the roofs in a systematic way, using for that purpose her special registration card. Quite some task. Presently Denmark has 1516 Romanesque churches and 168 Gothic. At the end of Elna Mello's work, the special church roof trusses, which had been published by Milo in 1887, were now classified as Romanesque and put at the beginning of the chronological series of roofs. With the introduction of general <coughs> chronology, things began to change and typical for Elna Mello, she wanted to make use of this new research tool. In 1986, a new project was started in southwestern and southern Jutland. It was a cooperation between the National Museum, represented by Möller and her colleague Hans Stiesdal, and the local museum of the town of Reibe, represented by Per Christian Madsen. Uh, 
I published the results of dendrochronological sampling and analysis from a total of 23 medieval parish churches in 2007. The project had the double aim of dating the different types of trusses and roofs, as well as the churches and especially the change in use of different building materials. Some results. The aral type, which like the Ruaga type, was considered one of the two oldest types, showed itself to have enjoyed a quite long life, not being exclusively used in the early phase of the stone church building. The roof of the K monument, Arild itself, was dated by general chronology to 1354. What you see here, and what we actually, actually found, was a well-preserved secondary roof construction. Uh, its older predecessor, uh, maybe one more. Uh, its older predecessor was constructed due to exactly the same principles, and it had left its impression on the inside of the eastern gable of the nave. We were able to document that the eastern standing gable truss in the nave from 1354 cannot be responsible for this impression, no matter what it moved, and in one or two. Uh, directions, a single piece or the whole truss, it does not fit in with the distinctive marks in the masonry. Uh, uh, this in fact is worth remembering, that impressions left in the masonry are to be considered just as important as the standing roofs and eventual older timber fragments, and later repairs always have to be considered. In this case, in the shape of a total removal, using the same type of truss. Then again, some 250 years later, another repair was carried through in Arild in 1700s on the tie beams towards the nave. An inscription on one of them tells that, and we know they were bought uh, the oaks for this in 1699. Uh, one of the uh, I have to see here. I think, yeah, here's the nave. Um, uh, one of the four so called Romanesque roof types, which were published by Milo in 1887, actually covers the nave in yellow. This church is the locus uh, classicus among all Danish granite ashlar churches. The reason is that one of its tympanon carries an inscription telling that the church was consecrated in 1140. However, dendrochronological analysis carried out uh, showed that the roof in the nave dates to around 1305 and that of the chancel to around 1315. Obviously, we have to do with a full replacement of the entire roof. Further dendrochronological analyses uh, in uh, 2011 were carried out on the three other roofs of this type, including Sedding and uh, Velling. They confirmed the dating of Gjellrup and indicated that this type of round arched trusses indeed should be dated to the second part of the 13th and the beginning of the 14th century. Its parallels are found in France, Flanders and North Germany not only on churches, but also in Cistercian abbey buildings, for instance, above the dormitory, as well as in town halls and hospitals. The king post of the apse in uh, so, uh, South Hegum, some kilometers east of Reibe, is a part of the basic dendro curve for this area. Its last preserved jeering grew in 1161, Maybe this inspired a somewhat similar dating of the roof of the nave. Dendro, however, showed it was made of local oak wood from after 1440. Other examples of the same kind from the Romanesque churches around the great forest of Ferris are also late medieval. And Soro Abbey church and a small glimpse from its roof. Uh, and such is the magnificent great roof above the Cistercian Abbey Church of Sør in Ceyland from 1515 to 1525, which has been published by Thomas Bertelsen. 
the still most common types and these are the trusses uh, with a tie beam and or one or more color beams have been recorded widely all over Denmark. Some earlier attempts of dating these types to the time of the erection of a church have to be reconsidered. Not that the type as such was not there, but it was used for a much longer period, as for instance in Thorstrup in southwestern Jutland, which were believed to be Romanesque. Now this roof has been dated to around 1400. In fact, and remembering the results from Gjellrup, one should restrain from using the terms Romanesque nor Gothic concerning roofs. The general impression left by the project was that original extant roofs were not as many as estimated by Möller and those which could be documented were generally somewhat or even a great deal younger than she had suggested. Later systematic dendrochronological research by the inventory work Danmark Kirke on the island of Finan show a large range of late medieval roofs due to a great number of repair works and supplementary buildings being added. On Sealand, we still very much need to consider the numerous late medieval roofs which are mainly known from a first survey of the material. In fact, the oldest church roof in Denmark, which could be dated by dendrochronology, is to be found on the church of Gunse Magle, just outside the episcopal town of Roskilde. This roof was dated around um, 1100. In this respect, some further experiences from the South Jutland project should be remembered. Apps roofs were believed not being able to produce reliable dendrochronological results, but this was changed. Vilslev Church and its apps with 13th century roofs. The conclusion is that the landscape of South uh, Western and South Jutland may have been the homeland of independently acting church lords and church wardens and that its character in the 12th and the 13th century to a quite high degree was that of an innovation field. Vidding Church and its building history. The impressive building history of the Tufa Stone Church in Vidding, 8 kilometers south of Reibe, is an illustration to this. Romanesque twin towers were added to the nave in the west and side aisles were planned due to which um, gothic windows were cut in the raised upper wall of the nave, like those in the cathedral of Reibe. This was done at the middle of the 13th century, as far as dating from its roof tell us. This means that new as well as more old-fashioned ways were productive along each other and that the use of volcanic tufa stones from the Rhineland may have been chosen by the church lord in order to connect to former traditions. Just to mention, brick for building were at hand in Rebe from the very middle of the 12th century, giving the opportunity to use them instead of tufa sto stone. This may represent a regional pattern which may also be found in the way of securing the roof trusses by putting in a set of inner vertical short struts that seems to have been done from around 1200, at the same time when similar struts came up in Germany according to Günther Binding, or even a bit earlier. My guess is that the Danish carpenters being used to raise thousands of wooden houses, including large wooden halls, uh, took to the same technical um, solutions as in the vast majority of the, their local buildings. The erection of a series of trusses standing on the top construction of a couple of timber walls very much resembles that of putting up some roofs on the two side walls of a stone church. Uh, uh, quite recent work with Kalle Melane and others in the parish church of Norre Kirke Bay on the island of Falster gave some very interesting uh, results. Indications for similar original roofs with have been documented from some churches on, churches on Sealand. This meant that such a church roof seen from the outside were quite lower than today and that they may indeed have had a shape like this one which was reconstructed on the church in Herbie in North Zealand. It actually reminds of the roof of Basilica. Um, 
in Herbie in North Zealand, it actually reminds of the roof of a basilica, albeit in a very modest scale, and it was covered by wooden shingles. Herning, a reconstruction. One other possible example was recently discovered in the large Romanesque brick church in Serboy in Northern Zealand. Serboy is a deserted town which explains the size of the church which you see here with its large late Romanesque or early Gothic western tower. This in fact replaced an earlier tower. Next picture which was taken less than two weeks ago, is from the upper story of the present tower. Uh, the square, and now we are looking towards the central part of the west side of the eastern wall of the tower, standing here, remembering the results from other churches, it suddenly became clear that the bottom part of the brick masonry, which forms the top of a triangle, actually represents a triangular gable, which has been partly demolished partly reused for the erection of the eastern wall of the present tower. The square or rather rhomboid tile with the ornament on the outside may reflect the place of a horizontal beam on the other side of the original gable pointing eastwards, a beam which must have supported a number of rafters for the roof to the east of the gable wall. Conclusion is that the large Romanesque brick church in the deserted town of Serboy carried a western twin tower facade. Inside it also had a west gallery carried by two pillars. Maybe these two significant features were meant to indicate the importance of the town lord or his representative. And maybe the present late Romanesque or early Gothic tower was a change on behalf of the burghers. In our perspective, the important thing here is that a certain de detail from the knowledge about how the roofs on Romanesque churches may have left their marks on the masonry must be considered really important to notice. And that the field of research is still open, even giving new hints as to how uh, the wooden churches might actually have looked like. And we know so very little about wooden churches which have which have only been found and excavated in a very small number. How uh, legal it is? Yeah. Uh, on roofings. Timber constructions are only there in order to carry the shelter of the house, its roofing. Very often one can read in research literature that most medieval churches were covered with lead plates from the first time of their erection. Much later the church accounts tell another story about repairs and quite some other and cheaper materials which have mostly been understood as the result of bad economy after the Middle Ages. I mentioned briefly the parish church of Kalslund. On the upper side of its trusses rose uh, rows of tree nails were still found. They probably once carried long rafters placed horizontally along the nails in order to carry a thatched roof. It may have looked like the one shown here and similar nails have been found in other roofs in the same district. Maybe lead was too expensive or difficult to obtain even in southwestern Jutland where trade on the North Sea, North sea had functioned for centuries. Yes, probably. But the main question is if lead actually was, a common, was as common as believed. An investigation from the roof of the Abbey Church in Sore indicated that this church had a roof of lead on the least parts of the building when it burned in 1247. Analysis showed that this lead came from somewhere in the vicinity of Aachen uh, or the Rhineland whereas the lead coffin for the abbey founder, Archbishop Absalon, was made by English lead. He was buried 1201 in the church chancel and he may have been actively dealing in lead, according to some rather unusual written sources from the second part of the 12th century. This may be the reason that literature often claims that lead was the predominantly used roofing material on the stone churches. To cover more or less all Danish Romanesque churches from present day Denmark, that is some 2,000 churches, and here the churches to the east of the Öresund are not included, with lead plates from the beginning seems unrealistic. 
the amount of lead needed for this exceeds the known medieval production of lead when we look at later production figures from England. Uh, and this was uh, the end of uh, Pa Christian Madsen's uh, presentation. Okay, now I start again. <laughs> um, my name is Callum Elaine and I'm a craft researcher and a PhD student as uh, Almevik told you. Uh, and I will present some uh, 12th century East Danish uh, roof constructions from the medieval diocese of Lund. A major part of this information has been collected in a diocese project uh, called Historic Carpentry Art in the Diocese of Lund, uh, where I had uh, great co workers in uh, Peter Jansson from the Region Museum and um, Hans Lindersson from the Dendro Lab and uh, the Diocese um, Heritage Officer Heike Ranta uh, that unfortunately got sick as well in the flu uh, was highly involved. Um, and very short about uh, the Diocese project. The general aims was to preserve by enlightenment what is known can be valued and what is valued can be saved. And um, the main uh, thing was um, to look at the constructions uh, in uh, different modern perspectives uh, so they can be ma maintained for future generations. But in the same time I started a PhD um, uh, project and in this project um, is about 12th century uh, carpentry art in the Diocese of Lund. And uh, when I studied uh, roof constructions in the Diocese of Lund, uh, or otherwise, I sta started maybe looking a bit square with modern uh, norms and uh, ideas about everything. So maybe I thought this uh, piece of art is uh, very square uh, from my standing point in 2022 but in my research I wanted to look from other perspectives so um, if it, oh, it didn't work maybe anyway this is a piece of art so when it changed direction it uh, from another point of view it's like a circle so um, I always want to think about uh, when I'm looking at uh, the constructions in a modern way or in a historic way. And um, many research <coughs> might be like this with uh, modern uh, kinds of typology or structural en engineering with uh, uh, modern um, explanation uh, models. But uh, and uh, I work there also, but I want to be in my research more from an inside view and uh, not act as an expert, but as an apprentice to learn from the past and not to judge the past. Uh, and then I look at uh, the, so the sources, is uh, the thing, uh, and uh, my pre knowledge uh, is very low uh, valued for me. Uh, so um, I'm a craft researcher and um, then I don't want to know about uh, modern uh, ways of explaining craft research or I want to know also how it could be explained from medieval ways. So uh, this is uh, someone Peregrinus in 1269 wrote about qualifications of the experimenter. Whoever wishes to experiment should be acquainted with, with the nature of things. He must also be skillful in manipulation in order that he may produce these marvelous effects. Through his own industry he can to some extent correct the errors that a mathematician would inevitably make if he were lacking in dexterity. In experimentation great skill is required for very frequently without it the desired result cannot be obtained. 
because there are many things in the domain of reason which demand this manual dexterity. And before I come to the 12th century, let's see if this works. Yeah, it worked. Uh, very important for me has been uh, the reconstruction project of Sörraråda medieval church. Uh, it started in 2007 and went on to last year and we reconstructed uh, a medieval church using medieval techniques. In the beginning we had um, um, craft ideas about uh, how everything should be done based in uh, 18th and 19th century carpentry. And then we judged the constructions as being bad uh, craft and so on. But when we understand, understood that we had to deconstruct everything we knew and act as, act as apprentices, uh, quite different uh, results came up. And this is from a sister project led by a, a colleague, Don Eliakson where we had one chance to reconstruct 13 meter long rafters uh, and it was filmed, this experiment. And uh, if we failed it, no one had done this for hundreds of years, but we had um, made craft experiences in Serra Roda for some years that we could use. And uh, we also learned how you can carry out a very big pine just by hand craft, 13 meter long. It's just to make piece, make it into pieces. Um, so this is uh, my craft uh, research point of view and perspectives uh, when I'm studying these uh, constructions. And uh, I'm uh, uh, my study is uh, medieval uh, diocese of Lund. And it was really a part of Denmark and uh, the dotted line shows uh, the eastern part uh, of uh, medieval Denmark, uh, the Diocese of Lund. And this thick red line uh, shows uh, today's uh, Diocese of Lund. And I show this because uh, in much literature uh, Medi the Diocese of Scania is described as uh, like a peripheral region of uh, medieval Sweden, which is simply wrong. And um, churches with intact East Danish roof constructions from 1143 to 1250 in the Diocese of Lund. Uh, I only have seven uh, quite uh, intact uh, constructions to work with. So this, um, and then, um, uh, for example, full tofta, and it can be discussed if it's intact because um, the tie beams and the wall plates, uh, they are from uh, this building of the church, but then a fire in 1270 uh, uh, made it necessary to change all the rafters. So they are a bit later, but uh, the, the construction is very intact uh, anyhow, so it's really easy to interpret it. And um, so that's one of my um, so-called intact. And um, uh, in some of the intact uh, uh, roof constructions, the tie beams has been cut off uh, when the vaults was made. So they maybe are not as intact as the ones from medieval Sweden, all, but. Um, Anyhow, and um, in three of these churches, um, it's not the original, original uh, roof constructions, but uh, constructions built after a devastating fire. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, to get a more general view of uh, the carpentry art from that time, I also really use the more fragmentary church uh, roof constructions. And I have about 65 of them uh, from uh, medieval uh, diocese of Lund. Uh, and then I have to say something about uh, late medieval uh, roof constructions. 
there are very many in uh, uh, medieval uh, or in today's uh, Diocese of Lund. Um, so I have at least 80 very intact. I don't re even bother to tell about uh, the fragmentary because there are so many. Uh, but um, this is not my focus, it was just to show that we have a lot. And of the, these 80, the 37 of them are um, on um, church towers. And very many of the church towers in uh, Scania is built in the uh, 15th century. So many of them have their original roof constructions still. And um, also something short about Dendro, because for over 20 years I have worked very close with uh, Hans Lindersson on the Dendro lab. And uh, um, when I started to collaborate with him, he also worked with Barbro Sonea, uh, who started uh, in 2004 and made a Dendro sample form. Um, quite similar to this one, but I have... Uh, worked a bit with it and uh, put more about uh, craft in it. So since 2004 this has been used uh, more or less uh, when dendro sampling has been done and all the time when we have done uh, dendro sampling in the diocese project. And I also have been inspired of uh, Frederike Pod, uh, uh, how he works with uh, roof constructions. So I really want to uh, know everything, not just uh, a felling date, but the length and the width and how it's taking from the log in order to be able to say exactly how many trees was used for each um, roof construction. And here is uh, just some uh, examples of uh, 12th century roof constructions uh, from the diocese. Uh, and uh, when I started, I also used the words Roman, Romanesque and Gothic, but I think it's really problematic because um, some people mean uh, Romanesque is uh, something about time, some mean it's about just type, and um, some probably don't know what they mean when they use the word, and uh, it's a modern word, the people... Uh, in the 12th century had no idea that they should follow these uh, rules made up in the 19th century. So I think it's um, kind, of, kind of hard to use. Uh, for example, uh, I have um, 10 churches, um, so-called Romanesque church with Gothic roof constructions. Um, original Gothic roof constructions, uh, so that's kind of strange. And um, here's the one of the Gothic ridge beam constructions. And um, in Scania, or medieval Denmark, as well as in Sweden, um, it was common uh, with either a ridge beam construction, a construction uh, where you don't have an actual roof truss uh, connected in the apex, but instead you have to place the ridge beam first and then put in uh, the rafters secondary and they are not uh, connected, they are into mortises uh, in the ridge beam. And uh, this is one of the most well preserved and uh, the church, they are then related to 1150s and um, uh, the church have an original barrel vault of stone, so, um, and it, um, it's called a Romanesque church, but with a Gothic uh, roof construction. And uh, Romanesque roof trusses, um, Nat Alcock uh, kindly uh, gave me this picture of a uh, Romanesque lattice roof truss drawn in the Carolinian time, late, late 9th century. So they didn't know they were supposed to wait a bit. And um, uh, the other example, the photo is a Romanesque roof truss from the 20th century uh, on a shed in uh, Scania. So 
not so useful to call it Romanesque maybe. And then I go on to talk a bit about 17 Romanesque lattice roof constructions uh, and they are from the 12th, 13th, 15th, 16th and 18th, 19th century. So uh, they didn't know how to behave in uh, the diocese for sure. And uh, here are the examples and um, also two from uh, the time when uh, the diocese uh, became uh, part of Sweden. So the first ones are Danish. And uh, this one from Ronneby, it just looks like uh, a lattice roof truss, but it's actually a half timbered gable wall. And um, the roof construction is um, absolutely not like this. So but it looks a bit like them. So only if you, if you only look uh, typology way, it could look like they uh, belong to each other. And you can see this one and that one and that one and that one are very similar from very uh, long times in difference. And uh, here's, um, I made a scan of this, uh, it, uh, in Pastop chancel. If you think it's not really very good, it's because I used my phone and um, used 10 minutes to make this uh, model. But for me, it's very important to see the, not just a flat uh, roof truss, but see the 3D way of uh, the construction and uh, how they built it. Uh, there are two idioms, God is in the detail, the, or the devil is in the details. You just can pick and choose which you like, but um, uh, for me, when I do a craft research uh, uh, investigation, I don't just lo look at the typology, I look at several, several things and process them in my head. I look at wood species, wood quality, how is the timber taken from the log cross section, morphology of the timbers, tool marks, used woodworking techniques, types of joints, used nails, dovels. I try to do a geometric analyze. Tra is there any traces of transport? Are there any carpentry marks? Uh, the connections between the roof construction uh, and the walls, are they original, secondary, has the just burnt? And then also, but only as one little tiny thing of this, the typologic form of the roof construction. Because um, as the, I don't think uh, it works uh, just to use the typologic way. Uh, and one detail I went deeper into was uh, convex tie beams um, that is uh, quite abundant. Uh, uh, in the diocese. And uh, up there, uh, my colleague Peter Jansson, uh, many years ago, uh, when he also noticed them, he wrote them or, or draw them like uh, cigars and uh, call them cigar shape. And uh, when you crawl around and, w and you measure, they are thicker in the middle and uh, thinner in the ends. You might make them like big cigars, but if you draw them and uh, or look at them it's hard to see the convex form because it sometimes it's only two centimeters less uh, in the ends but uh, the difference is there because um, um, they seems only to exist in the 12th century in uh, the diocese and uh, then uh, something ha changes in the norms and they make them parallel um, so I really wanted to investigate them and I did it together with, um, uh, for example, um, uh, the Denver Cornelist uh, in uh, Lund University. And I also looked a bit uh, around Europe, so there are other examples of uh, convex shaped uh, tie beams and uh, in England it's, it's maybe not exactly tie beams, uh, it's more like uh, big color beams and so on. So it's something maybe different in England, but um, there are some nice uh, examples in uh, France and Belgium. 
anyhow, uh, we also dipped into the provenance of the 12th century oak in the roofs of uh, where there are uh, thigh beams. And Anton Hansson looked again at the old um, uh, dendro analysis to m make the provenance even uh, better. So he came up with this uh, and everything was quite local. And um, then I found uh, this map uh, that Fredrik Svanström, an archaeologist, made to we put together different uh, information from um, uh, where there was uh, prehistoric monuments, uh, major watercourses, etc. And uh, where there were uh, kind of forests in the late um, Iron Age. And when I put those together, we could even refine uh, the provenance uh, 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 map using different uh, information. If we look at the tool marks of the, of the very oldest uh, tie beams and um, rafters in the diocese uh, from the 1060s, they have a very flat, smooth surface made with, um, in a continental way, with a continental ewing technique where you use some broad axe going forward. Uh, but there are still traces of uh, the Scandinavian way of using spread tugning. Uh, as you can, oh, it's too fast. Uh, here is spread tugning. Then you go, uh, instead of, if this is the timber, instead of ewing cross the fibers, you, you, the X hits uh, the tree with the fibers and uh, you can get this uh, fishbone pattern. That was the way uh, uh, Scandinavians uh, um, uh, worked with wood. Uh, but on the oldest um, refined continental, and, and this is an indication of uh, the transport of um, uh, carpenters from abroad um, in the initial phase of the church buildings. And uh, again, about details, here is uh, this uh, tie beam is actually over 11 uh, meters long. And um, I've um, looked at many of the different uh, connections and so on to understand it. Uh, and again, here it was initially spread tugged and then uh, the other kind of um, uh, continental technique was used to raise this um, and uh, uh, also I look into geometry does not geometry teach how to measure every dimension through which carpenters and stone workers work and um, in um, Fairlov I found uh, this small uh, geometric uh, um, graffiti and uh, I, using it I could uh, reconstruct the possible way that they have uh, made to make these uh, roof trusses uh, from the 1160s. And uh, we have found carpentry marks in um, about um, I think it was seven um, of the 12th century churches. And uh, as Pak Christian Madsen told, uh, we also have made us uh, looked into roofing materials and um, we do not actually have one super proof of uh, lead roofs uh, from the 12th uh, century originally, only about from churches that burnt in 1234 and 1270s. Uh, and the parallel tie beams, uh, the oldest example we have is from 1185 in uh, Norawesum Church. And uh, this is one of the most intact uh, roof truss uh, from Lyngfjö from 1140s, but it's a secondary roof because the church burnt. And uh, I went uh, to Liege in Belgium to see if uh, uh, I thought maybe they were inspired in uh, Scania to make 
the same kind of uh, convex tie beams, but these are much, much ruder, uh, the surfaces uh, in uh, Belgium. Uh, and uh, here's from uh, France. I visited um, Frédéric Pod and uh, one of his colleagues showed me this one and it's also very much more rude, uh, uh, the surfaces. Uh, so I uh, made some conclusions uh, that uh, transdisciplinary research increased the possibility to answer questions uh, concerning silviculture, craft, zeitgeist and so on and a lot more and I have not so much time so um, um, I also looked into not only roof trusses but this is a golden altar that I examined together with uh, for example Pa Christian Madsen and I also d done um, geometric analysis on this one and um, there are lots of 12th century doors and there's lots of uh, built-in wood window frames in the diocese I've looked into with the same questions. Uh, and uh, when I started to look at this uh, built-in uh, wooden frames I thought it maybe was just something uh, that was in um, uh, medieval Denmark but as you can see there they were quite abundant in Europe. So. And uh, this is uh, my last uh, picture and I will want to thank the organizers and have all you have listened and all that I've worked with. And uh, this is from Liege. Uh, this is from 1015 to 20, so it's very old. And the vaulting is made of wood from the 18th century, very thin. And I was there with Patrick Hafsamer and he standed on one of those and he just jumped down on them and everything was... But uh, I thought if he can walk on it, I can also, so I can see these marvelous uh, tie beams. And we still live, so <laughs> it worked. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kalle. Quite an impressive talk, talks. Uh, we got a lot of you, and, uh, but maybe we'll keep you here for a couple of minutes before we uh, let Fredrik enter the mm -hmm. stage here. If there are any questions, Ylva, Sandin. Ylva Sandin, uh, Rice Research Institute. Uh, I just wondered, uh, hearing about this, uh, what is known about the carpenters? Um, do, does anyone know if they were a guild and they went around building these churches? Or were these churches built by peasants around the church? Or <laughs> yeah, who built them and uh, how was knowledge transferred? Uh, there's not very much uh, information from the 12th century and um, I think it's not uh, just black and white because um, um, I think there was some head carpenters maybe from abroad or from other regions uh, Abbot Sigur uh, from France writes um, again and again that variation was very important variation with uh, craftsmen from abroad he talks about the interiors and so on, but so many times that variation is important. So it was kind of status to take, not use uh, just local uh, builders, I think. And um, then also in the great building period in um, medieval Denmark, uh, there was still uh, slaves. Uh, when the building period was uh, finished, uh, the slave system was um, banished. So um, I think uh, there was uh, a hierarchy of uh, craftsmen and uh, co workers and so on. Okay. 
Yes, thank you very much. I'm Panu. Yes, yes, it's on. Yes, Panu Savolainen from uh, Aalto University, Finland. Uh, my question is that uh, have you discovered or found in these structures any any uh, recycled timber material? Yeah. <coughs> so, so that, for example, traces of even earlier churches or other yes. buildings. How much do does this o occur in these churches that you have researched? Uh, Unfortunately, I only have about seven uh, churches from the 12th century. But uh, in Nora Melby church, for example, the stone church is from 1130s, but the tie beams in the chancel are from 1060s. So they are from a uh, wooden stave church. And this wooden stave church um, was actually some centimeters uh, more space in. Uh, the room than uh, in the the nave from 1130s with 11 meter long uh, tie beams because the tie beams from 1060 was 9 meters and 20 centimeters and uh, didn't have one and a half meter walls so uh, that is one example but uh, also um, the gothic uh, construction from Bjergsjö with the uh, uh, stone vault uh, the struts or also from the stave church uh, uh, and this is uh, proved by with dendrochronology also thank you thank you very much Kalle. thank you okay yeah <laughs> the last question here yes. thank you um my question um to <laughs> Pierre and Massen, uh, I, I uh, read uh, he found um, runes as assembly or as uh, carpenter marks, and mm. I found it on Silt Island of Silt too. And do you found runes on in the north and in the east in in uh, diocese of uh, Lund? Yeah, uh, as well. Yeah, but uh, not in the 12th century. It's a later thing. Later, yeah, in uh, Zult in the beginning of 13th century. Yeah, and uh, uh, up 20s. to the 14th, 15th century. And some of those are more like rune like. Uh, it's, uh, not sure if they actually thought them to be runes, but in Sweden, in Hög Church, uh, far up in Sweden, Helsingland, I think. Uh, uh, there are for sure they are runes because they use the foot arc um, and put one rune extra for every um, rafter and I think they are from the late 12th century if I am correct they, and, and if they are they are the oldest ones I know in the, the use like this that's interesting in uh, Kaitum the uh, uh, church Kaitum on the island of uh, Silt it's dated in the nave 1223 i think and it's only uh, uh, some uh, over but um, i saw it futhark yeah y yeah and uh, in uh, uh, today denmark uh, pa christian madsen has one church with uh, actual runes i think it's dated to 1250 if i remember correct Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for the invitation to this workshop. I hope you all hear me now when we are approaching also the end of the day. And indeed, I will zoom out a little bit and also hope my voice is not failing me today since all the lecturing yesterday on the undergraduate courses of so my voice. And ah, I hope it works. And I have some water here. And actually, this is not really a topic I thought in the beginning when I was asked for this workshop, for this conference, because I'm using felling dates in a secondary way. I've collected more than 50,000 dates. I will come back to that with Vanny Edge from around northern, central and western Europe for quite another purpose. And only a minority of them, a few percentage, are for actually from church buildings. Uh, this is from a variety of sources and for an entirely different purpose to see them uh, societal well-being or even 
indirectly demographic trends across space and time and see what, what type of association you may detect with other type of information, both documentary and archaeological. And I will also acknowledge some of my key, key collaborators, especially Andrea Seim from the University of Freiburg, which I work, uh, we worked very closely in the last few years with one of these articles that I will present some results from, but also Bill Tegel from the same university, Paul J. Krusic and Ulf Bündgen, both from the University of Cambridge. So my point of departure really for this project is that past variations in building activity can provide a lot of information. It provides information on demographic changes, economic changes and social conditions. In times of plenty and of demographic growth, you may build. But in times of crisis and when you even have a population decline or at least a stagnation, you will build less. You can also see it in modern uh, economic trends and when you have economic crisis, building typically stops, not entirely, but slows down. When in times of rapid growth and large societal surplus, you build a lot. And I think this also holds true for pre-modern times. So if we can ac assess building construction rates, the relative level of building construction rates back in time, we can also assess, at least to a certain extent, societal well-being, kind of measuring it, or at least as an indicator proxy. And we can also reach societal groups that back in medieval times or even early modern times in large part of Europe is not leaving any really tra traces in the documentary sources before we have census data and not all groups are even including in many parts of Europe in the tax <coughs> data. So we might can get an entirely independent form of information if we can get the annual at least decadal building activity rates. So this is the point of departure. So the problem is here that prior to the 18th century and some parts they even maybe we can go back to the 17th century, we don't have good information from documentary sources of building activity rates, nor for demographic uh, data. So we can't really quantify it from traditional sources. So here comes the felling dates. Because can we find alternative source material? That we can quantify rates in space and time of building activity. And I say, yes, we can, because we have felling dates that have been collected since the 1970s. And a large part of them actually do contain the Vanny Edge, the exact felling year. Sometimes we can even uh, be sure about the season, if it's growing season or non-growing season felling. What we can't get information about unfortunately, is the building year, because it's a time lag, typically from one to four years, from the felling of a tree uh, to the time when the tree was used for a construction. And this time lag, it differs in space and time, and it will be very hard to pinpoint. So we can say that when we have the exact felling year, we will know within approximately five years the building typically was constructed. It will probably be exceptions for that too, but as far as we know from documentary sources and other information, it's a lag of one to four years typically. That said, I think everyone here knows the basic of the science of dendrochronology. Uh, but just very briefly, we can, when we have now I don't know if this is the laser pointer is really working. No. Anyhow, I couldn't see the laser point. But you can cross state from living and dead trees and also archaeological material if it's the same species and the same approximate region. And we can also do that with quite large confidence today thanks to the modern computer programs and large uh, 
reference data sets. <laughs> it had expanded tremendously since the 80s, even 90s, early 2000s. And it's a very, very low likelihood today, if you have 50 to 80 rings, that you get the wrong date. And uh, uh, this have been made some tests of this in this data set also, and it didn't exist any, any problem from that source. Uh, you can collect a lot of data, I would say approximately 400,000 dates, but only about 54,000 I managed to find from uh, with the Vanage. And this is secondary data. This is from a lot of... I'm sorry, what happened now? It's... Uh, I need some help. I just went forward and this uh, didn't work, like the laser pointer didn't work either. But I can in the meantime point out that all this data is collected for other purposes. It's collected for dating individual buildings in the type of cultural heritage pro projects that have been talked about earlier today. Not mainly from church buildings, but from... Um, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, also from um, mainly small villages and small towns on the countryside where many, especially in Central Europe, but also in the UK, uh, buildings from burghers and the, I would say the middle classes have been preserved, or at least parts of the buildings. It's also from archaeological timber, including bridge buildings and the fortifications. But 90% of the collected data is from villages and small towns. And it's a German bias in this data set. And this is partly because of uh, collaborations with German scientists and um, also a special uh, early computer programs to store the data in a standard format that was mainly developed in Germany. Oh. So this is a very variety of, uh, of, uh, of data and comes uh, from a variety of structures. So it's a very heterogeneous data set and this is important to remember when we're trying to understand the results. But I will back, uh, go back in time about 120 years or so to the father of dendrochronology as a modern science, Andrew Douglas, a professor of astronomy at the University of Tucson. He came to Tucson, Arizona, before it was a state even, when it was a territory and an adobe village. And they started the university and observatory there uh, because of it, the clear sk bright skies in the desert landscape. And he found in the deserts of Arizona in the mountains that the trees had clear annual rings and you could very clearly see that there was the amount of soil moisture, that is precipitation in Arizona, winter precipitation, that entirely governed the tree ring width. And he started to also not only see that you could get climate information and build out chronologies, he built chronologies himself and had managed to do that by 1921, that went back to 600, after, uh, 600 AD. And to date, uh, ancestral Pueblian and Asasi ruins across the southwestern United States, mainly in New Mexico. So early, already in the early 1920s, the first publications appeared with felling dates. And here's an example from Natural Geographic magazines, when you could uh, date, when you really dated the Anasazi ruins. So this is quite old science in archaeology in the American Southwest, and we also have more recent publications. Before my first article of felling dates in 2018, this was the largest one a collection ever made, and it's not only the Van Edge, and it's total of almost 30,000 dates from the American Southwest, from Pueblo ruins. And you can see four distinct building phases here. Unfortunately, this laser pointer is not, I think, working. But you still see the four faces and also that the, those with the uh, uh, <coughs> vanny edge or near vanny edge, the sapwood and the non-cutting edge, they also match up quite distinctly in four phases of building activity. And I observed this article back in 2016 when it appeared. And also in a workshop in Austria, I met some of the uh, authors, or one of the authors, and was thinking, can you do something similar in Europe? 
There have been some small studies done, as we all know, for Dalarna in Sweden, for parts of Switzerland, uh, other parts of the Alps, the Carpathians. There have been some studies in the UK, local regional study for Van Valley or for one district or even one province. Uh, but can you compile it in a similar way as the Pueblo ruins across the American Southwest to do it for Europe or at least a portion of Europe and go back in medieval times? And that was what appeared in 2018, linking European building activity with plague history. And in this article, to make a long story short, uh, we compiled a huge data set of close to 50,000 dates only with the Van Edge. Between 1250 and 1699, we didn't want to go into the 18th century because you have too many buildings basically preserved and you had another slightly another interest in what type of buildings have been dated in a more modern time. And before 1250, you have a very uneven spatial coverage and it's a bias towards churches. And, we all, and the idea was to compare it with the plague data set that is not perfect, but it's just in numbering the number of uh, plague outbreaks in a French data set from the 1970s. There's a lot of problems with the data that is discussed in the article. And this is linear, the trended and standardized. And I will not go into the technical details, the statistical details, but it's a large uh, scale statistic studies and if you just pinpoint some certain periods here the number of dates and the mean number of dates per year or the median and the standard deviation between the years and the numbers we have we can see some interesting patterns if you look at the late medieval crisis and the 30 years war you clearly see a decline preceding the black death in the building activity numbers in the um, in this data set, a quite strong dec uh, decline that is, of course, an even further decline, but quite modest after the Black Death. Then we have the Thirty Years' War. It's about the 35% decrease that exactly starts at the onset of the war, interestingly. At the Peace of Astphalia, the building activity recovers within a few years. And this was remarkable because. This was detected not by only counting, we actually got trend breaks, in a, uh, statistical trend breaks by running MATLAB, a computer program, exactly 1618 and 1648, decrease and recovery. Uh, without any, I mean, tweaking, it was just what the data showed. And, it, and the 30 years war, since this is a German biased data set, is a kind of test bed to see if it can <coughs> capture meaningful information. And the second thing was to correlate it with other data. And then we saw, uh, especially when you have a kind of low pass filtering, a decal average, you get a very strong relationship with number of plague outbreaks and with grain prices. And uh, uh, the interesting thing here is, of course, that plague will decrease building activity and the absence of plague will increase it. And the other thing is when the pr food prices or grain prices were high, you built less. And when the prices were, uh, uh, were low, you built more. It's quite evident, but it's a kind of persistent and strong relationship. And we also looked on the t 10 and 20 years with most recorded plague outbreaks, how the building activity goes down. And you see kind of a maximum after three years. And remember, this is the felling dates and not the building dates. Uh, so it might be actually closer to the actual outbreak of the plague when the, when the building actually declined. But it's, uh, this, is hard, this is hard to say, but you see a pattern and then it's back after year five, it's back to pre-plague conditions. Uh, so this is a very basic summary of what we could find. So we could find a meaningful, clear plague signal in the European felling date data set and a close correlation to grain prices. And, and also pinpoint the 30 years war and the onset of the late medieval crisis. So this year a new article appeared with a larger data set, with a larger number of data contributors where we wanted to look in space. But of course, we couldn't cover entire Europe, 
we looked at seven regions and you see again the central European bias and certain UK bias and this is where not where we have datable buildings or indeed where the dates where we have dates from it's dates that could be accessed digitally and with people that wanted to collaborate some people for example in switzerland from certain canton archaeological office they said no we are not interested and others said yes so it's not that the county of geneva is lacking data uh, uh, and you see of course increase in the number over time and here we have over 54,000 dates with the Vanny edge it's a quite big data set but very unevenly distributed and if you look at this we the trend it and standardize it look at the story you get a kind of large sky scale micro historical story of Europe that and uh, this actually article was even picked up by BBC radio so it was a uh, little bit of impact outside academia of it uh, because I think it tells a nice story you see the onset of the late medieval crisis actually predating again very clearly the black death although if you go in regionally you see a difference here and for example here in Sweden or Norway it actually starts with the black death but not in northern Germany it's a uh, regional differences here but you see it quite clearly and then the recovery, the population boom in the 16th century and then maybe the German, the reformation, the peasants war in Germany is a bit unclear and then the onset very clearly of the 30 years war exactly 1618 and then the stepwise recovery. Um, you can also see some individual years and the lowest years of all is of building activity is when the actually in the when the Black Death reached Europe or, or ravaged Europe and when you have uh, really the worst part of the Thirty Years War. And uh, we also this is just heat map showing when you have the most uh, dates where you have the dates basic. It's not necessarily telling where you have the building. Uh, in but where you have preserved dates it kind of gives a hint maybe of uh, uh, hot spots of building activity and decline uh, but it's I think more showing where you have data in different time periods uh, you can do however some interesting uh, geostatistical studies which we did and include in this article that is free to find open access article on the internet uh, we have maps actually how we can see the, uh, the impact and timing of both the Thirty Years War and the late medieval crisis and the timing of recovery and we can see regions where we have a pre-Black Death late medieval crisis and the regions where it first starts with the Black Death and I think that's quite a clear picture and uh, al we also did this type of like trend break analyze and just uh, show the data for different regions and it's a bit arbitrary regions and I talked about this already when we see the late medieval crisis and in some parts we see in, like in Switzerland, southwestern Germany and parts of central Germany and Czechia where we have data we see actually continued increase up to the Black Death where in some other regions like especially Hanseatic region also in Sweden, France and like Austria we have a decrease already before the Black Death and then you see not every region is equally affected by the Black Death uh, but most regions are it is a general decline and after the end of the uh, I mean the first waves of the plague you have a recovery a strong recovery everywhere an increase everywhere Unfortunately, you see that this data set with Vanny edges when you go down to like um, 50 year periods or 40 year periods uh, in the medieval times, we don't have a very dense data coverage. Uh, we could have get much denser coverage and fill up the entire map basically if we di did include data with the non Vanny edge, but then you could have dating uncertainties maybe up to plus minus 20 years in the worst case. So let's go on to the 30 years war because I see the time is running out and I think here is the most interesting uh, story and not very clear 
unfortunately, but we divided Germany uh, or the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, of, uh, of um, three regions. Those that, according to documentary sources, have a population decrease of less than 33%. Those that have a population decrease in, after the Thirty Years' War between 33% and 66%. And those actually regions of Germany that were so devastated that they have a population decrease more than 66%, which was some parts that actually had. And then compare within these regions how, how strong is the decline in building activity during the Thirty Years' War. And we found in those regions that has a less than 33%, uh, population decline on average we have a 32 percent decline in those regions between 33 and, four, uh, and 66 percent population decline according to documentary sources we on average have a 41 percent decrease and in those regions with the more than 66 percent population decline in documentary sources we have a 68 percent decline in building activity so it fits very very nice it almost exactly follows the documentary sources estimates of demographic uh, decline with the decline we see in building activity is almost exact so here leads us on to the summary and to the main results. Uh, so construction activities, they decreased very clearly during periods with multiple plague outbreaks. And the biggest decrease seems to be three to four years after the large plague outbreaks. And we also have the number of felling dates. They were significantly lower when grain prices were higher and significantly building activity was significantly higher when grain prices were low and when they were high the building activity was lower and it was actually a Pearson correlation on the decadal time scale in the second article up to um, 0 0.6 in this relationship and we also have a moderate strong uh, association that I have not shown between estimated mining activity and building activity both seem to kind of follow each other especially in Western Europe and we can see that the late medieval crisis, the onset of it, is evident very clearly in the building activity in most of Europe or around 1300 or the 1290s, very clearly. And it's five decades then before the prior uh, Black Death and about two decades before the onset of the so-called Great Famine. And we can also then, as I Give, give, uh, gave several examples of, see a very clear abrupt decrease in building activity during the Thirty Years' War that exactly pinpoints the start and the end year of the war and more so also really fits the decrease of building activity, fits the decrease of population decline very nicely. And finally we can see, as was very evident from the maps, that in regions without average uh, adequate data coverage. We have um, difficulties to capture, I don't know if I should call it demographic trends or times of prosperity or times of crisis. We need a lot of data to be able to really pinpoint this and at the present stage we only have it for Central Europe. And I think I have to end there and this was also my last slide. So I think maybe some time for questions, I don't know. Thanks a lot, Frederick. This was really, really interesting. And I think if you want to build up a Dendro database here, I, a lot of people would support it, really. So. I think we have time for one or two short questions. Yes? Thank you. Uh, my name is Morten Stige, uh, Fabrica Heritage Services. Thank you for a very enlightening uh, talk. Uh, and it was also very interesting to see your data from the Americas uh, and the data from Europe. Uh, and there seemed to be a correlation, at least when it comes to this early 14th century. Uh, have you, I'm sure you have looked into this as an explanation what is what is climate and what is man-made um, crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, have, can you expand on that, please? 
Yes, you see this one that it goes down 1300. Uh, yes, I have reflected on that. It's actually a little bit intriguing because the great medieval mega droughts uh, that you have uh, in the American Southwest, it's those in between you see here in the late 1100s, that's a decline. It's partly co correlated to drought and also this in the 10th century decline. But it's, the worst drought is over in the, in the 1300s, in the 14th century. Uh, so this is actually intriguing. And in this article, actually, we have some indicate, indicators that it might actually be partly, for several reasons, it's also uh, nomad uh, tribes from the north and it's armed, we can see uh, archaeological evidence for armed conflicts and that you had to uh, for that reason abandon some settlements, but it also might on the high Colorado plateau is more than 2000 meters above sea level that is shorter growing seasons for corn that was the main crop. So it might be a climate component that coincides with the start of Little Ice Age and also worse on higher elevations and latitudes in Europe uh, for grain agriculture, but it's, um, it's quite different environments, but it might indirectly be <laughs> Uh, it's some evidence for increased year-to-year -year climate variability at that time period also, but it's, uh, it's a little bit shaky to be really sure from the data, but it might be in partially a climate, a climate signal here. It's also a transition in monsoonal Asia in the monsoon at that time. That's a very good question. Uh, Magnus Henriksson, uh, architectural conservator. Uh, if there is uh, almost one-to-one -one correlation between demographics and uh, uh, construction activity, I understood. Only during the Thirty Years' War with the population okay, decline. Okay. That's the only thing we have been able to test, I would say. We don't uh -huh, know uh -huh, otherwise yeah. because this it's is the only test bed, so to say. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit... Um, uh, puzzling because I thought the construction activity should uh, go even lower when there are bad times. Today there are there is the construction industry is the one fluctuating the most in our economy. Mm -hmm. I think one answer to that could be which Jankin Myrdal that many of you here in the room knows about commented on that it might be actually what type of buildings you are building in times of war for example the building of fortifications goes up and one final thing too is actually that you can see that certain is some articles uh, that showed from the Netherlands especially that some building types are not as sensitive to times of crisis and before the reformation that's the buildings belonging to the Catholic Church at least they don't seem to be sensitive for bad times like high grain prices where secular buildings are uh, sensitive they have a like more buffered so to say so it probably differs between buildings and it's something i would like to have a project about in the future because you have metadata not for all data but for some to both look at timber quality and age but also building type yes thank you very much for an interesting talk <coughs> and um, my question is about uh, uh, the possible uh, like trade of trees and secondly the the use of recycled material since uh, trees were felled in different places than they were used in very many cases in this era in 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 central europe and as well there might be quite a lot of uh, recycled material which ended up to a different place where it was originally assemb assembled to a building how do you uh have you been discussing in this article this possible bias which might somehow affect the results? We could only, in a few data sets, basically to be honest, don't discuss it. We mention the possibility. And we could only discuss that in a few data sets. Uh, I think from one from Alsace. <coughs> and one, uh, some from Switzerland, if I remember, and uh, one from the UK. Uh, 
we couldn't otherwise, due to lack of metadata, properly assess that. And we could see that this was a quite low percentage in this. It existed, certainly, and it will affect the signal, uh, affect the information on a local level quite a lot. But on this large scale level, it seemed to have a limited effect. And, it, and since it's also a building, is reduced. This felling date, the original date, have been built something else of in the beginning. So it will basically, even if it comes from a, like a 16th century building with a from a 14th century beam, it will give information then of the 14th century construction and not the 16th century construction. I think we close the question part here, but I have a feeling we will come back uh, to you and topics like this is uh, very engaged. So yes, thank you, Fredrik. Uh, we have now a last, not least speaker, Ulrich Klein, from the Freies Institute for uh, Bauforschung und Dokumentation in Marburg. And you will present to us a project on Romanesque roofs. Welcome. Good evening, dear colleagues. At the end of this very interesting day, I will now uh, give you some remarks on a project we um, developed in Germany some years ago and um, is uh, before the end now. At the beginning, some appetizers from our project. Um, some examples um, we have collected in Germany in a small working group called uh, AG Dachwerke. Here you see us in Sweden some years ago, find the spider. And um, this AG is a special interest working group on roof constructions and is meeting since 1997 um, as an informal association of building researchers who usually meet twice a year at different locations for an intensive exchange of information about historical roof constructions with the management of the Bavarian State Office for Monument Preservation, Bayerisches Denkmalamt. Five years ago, we got uh, the question from Patrick Hofsommer from Belgium or France um, about the development of the medieval roof constructions in Germany. What we can say, what is the stand? and uh, what can be compared with the uh, publications um, that they have in France at this time. So, we began a project under the working title Dated Roof Constructions uh, before 1230, which deals with the oldest wooden structures in Germany, in principle the Romanesque roof, if you like, uh, this title. As a result, at first, uh, the previous uh, status of the publications. Yes. Here, one example for one um, German federal state um, was um, collected, evaluated, and uh, then expanded to include a large of number of new findings so that five years after we have a well secured overview of the current status with around 200 objects in Germany. It turns out that only a small fraction of these existing constructions have already been published, mostly only regional while the majority unpublished was only known to a small group of editors and interested parties is and therefore not available for the research. We planned a publication as a teamwork of two editors, me and Burkhard Lohr from the south of Germany, 
and correspondence in the various federal states uh, in, of the Bundesrepublik uh, to get a first time uh, documentation as completely as possible of the largely unknown stock of the oldest pre-Romanesque and Romanesque roof constructions. The end date, 1230, is not to be understood as a rigid mark, but um, should uh, mark or show the beginning of the transition to the following constructions of the Gothic era, um, with all the challenges typical for this time. Um, the this time of um, uh, variation and going to Gothic um, constructions um, is uh, part of the um, time we say 1230 and 1250 because this is the period of changing in Germany. The focus of the catalog which, which is being compiled here for the first time, <coughs> is on the preserved and now dendro-dated roof constructions, which are each presented for the individual German federal states. We have in Germany uh, this um, construction, all cultural um, activities are uh, part of the single federal states, and so, um, we use this as a um, geographical um, part for uh, our research. We um, had a terminology agreed in the group and a basic common scheme for the description as well as a final editing um, that all constructions are presented in a comparable way. In addition to the complete constructions discussed, there are all the, all the selected spolia, traces of roofs, and other parts as impressions and early drawings as a necessary supplement. I show you some examples. Um, the drawing um, with um, the uh, dimensions of the roof. This was um, added by um, sh uh, chapters on the archaeolog archaeological finds. Um, as an example here from Lübeck, where, um, especially from the now um, Gründungsperiode, der uh, the city of Lübeck, there were finds as complete roof constructions um, preserved in the earth. A separate, detailed uh, chapter of more than 100 pages deals for the first time in detail with uh, the different Romanesque roof coverings, which form the outer end of the supporting structures and and interacting with the structure inside in many ways. As shown here, uh, as an example from Saxony Anhalt, such overuse are also created for the individual state overuse, were appreciated, and which are intended to present the different roof structures and types in all development. For every um, of the For every of the individual federal states, one colleague uh, uh, created overview maps for the location of the findings and the typological uh, classification. As a result, I can show you what we have in the different states here um, mapped. Um, you see in the south, Baden-Württemberg has the most, 
then followed by Hessen, Hessia, and Sachsen Anhalt, Sachsen Anhalt, where we could only choose 30 of the um, thought about 100 examples, uh, not to be um, um, researched in this uh, time we had. As an, um, excuse me. We had uh, an overview uh, on the um, neighboring countries too, with correspondence in uh, these countries. So we got 80% uh, of the um, research in these countries. And now the publication is ready for uh, the next year. Here, the program we have, it uh, will get two volumes, about um, a thousand pages. The problem is um, printing and paper at uh, our times today uh, got very expensive and uh, we found a solution in the last month, so uh, next year it uh, will be um, published and um, you can see what we found and what we have um, in Germany and in the neighboring country. I thank you very much with this uh, uh, tower of your interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lich. Now we have something to look forward to <laughs> in both the long perspective yes. next year and we have something to look forward to in the short perspective and that is we will have a dinner, at least most of us, tonight. Uh, yeah, we thought that we um, uh, take a little summary tomorrow morning and if, if you don't have any emergency questions right now, I yeah. think uh, <laughs> there is maybe a minute or two for that, of course. Uh. No emergency questions. <laughs> and then maybe you have some information yeah. to share. Maybe I should say something about the Uppsala Castle, <laughs> where we will have our dinner at one an, in one and a half hours. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does everyone find their way? Have, have you seen the castle? Yeah. <laughs> it's up on the hill there. <laughs> uh, lighted, I think, now. And you, when you come up to the big square in front of the castle, it's uh, like a portal, uh, and they would fire have fires there so you could see the the entrance but it's in this portal um, so something else tomorrow tomorrow we start at uh, 8 30 here so and the first coffee break is at quarter to 10 so have a coffee before yeah. <laughs> Good recommendation. Yeah. And before we end, we must say thank you for all yeah. speakers, all comments, and all the engagement yes. uh, from all of you here yeah. today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. See you okay. tomorrow. Yeah.